Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Pasadena Photography Arts Open Show number 2033. I could not be more excited to showcase the works of these five artists tonight. But first I wanna share with you how Pasadena Photography Arts began. 10 years ago, Bill and Kathy Wishner found themselves driving to the west side every weekend to see art. One Saturday evening, they looked at each other and said, aren't there artists on the east side of LA? And from that sprang up Pasadena Photography Arts. Our mission is to bring a greater awareness of photography to the east side of LA and help emerging photographers achieve success at all levels. And we will continue to do this programming. Whoops. We will continue to do this programming as long as the pandemic lasts and pot potentially keep something of this nature. Pasadena Photography Arts, your name could be here. Uh, we cannot do this, this work and bring programs of open show and forum to you without a little help from you. So donations are greatly appreciated. They can be made to PasadenaPhotographyArts.org through our website. Stay in touch with us through Facebook, Instagram, and learn about us on PasadenaPhotographyArts.org. A little Zoom checklist. Please remain muted during the duration of the event. We are encouraging and would want your questions. Please send questions to our chat and we will, we will bring them in current time to the artists as they speak. Each presentation will begin with a silent viewing so that we can really absorb the work and then the artists will speak about it. The event is being recorded. And so with not much more, I'd like to start. Please turn off your cameras so that we can have full attention on the artists. Thank you so much. It's okay. As I mentioned, we will silently view each project before I invite the artist to speak. So here we begin with the woods by Elizabeth Bailey. last one. Great. I asked each artist to share a fun fact. So in addition, so in addition to being a full-time mother, Elizabeth has a love for guinea pigs. In fact, so much so that she has three of her own, Puddles, Squeaky, and Cinnamon. And without further ado, this is Elizabeth Bailey with her project, The Woods. Hello, I am Elizabeth Bailey, a Los Angeles-based photographer. I use photography to create emotionally charged imagery that explores the themes of self, identity, memory, and longing. Since the 1990s, I've been using portraiture and self-portraiture with implied narratives to consider what we conceal and reveal about ourselves to others. I grew up in small town in Minnesota. My father was a photographer and a professor of cinema studies and taught me about photography from a young age. As far back as I can remember, we had a dark room in the basement. I moved to Los Angeles at age 18 and received a BA in philosophy from Occidental College. After graduation, I studied photography and graphic design in night classes and on the weekends. 
I've worked professionally as a graphic designer for many years while working on photographic projects as well. My photography has been exhibited in group shows nationally and internationally at galleries including Lightbox Gallery in Portland, Oregon, Photo Place Gallery in Middlebury, Vermont, and PH21 in Budapest, Hungary. My photos have been published in Shots Magazine and Stubborn Magazine, as well as numerous online publications. So today I'm going to tell you about my series, The Woods, beginning with my project statement. Next image. The Woods depicts my journey that is both personal and universal, actual and metaphorical, from a liminal time when I was seeking meaning and finding insight through solitude and self-reflection. After the profound transition of ending a marriage while raising a child led me to re-examine my early childhood wounds. Next image. I found myself drawn into the woods as I had been in my youth. Growing up in a tense, unhappy family, as a child, I sought solace by retreating into a wild, wooded area near my home. I escaped into nature and into solitary fantasies I created, fueled by fiction and imagination. The woods became my oasis, and as my own daughter now approaches adolescence, I see that she too is drawn to the stillness she feels in nature. Her world is hyper-connected and overwhelming, and as she struggles to define herself, next image, I'm reminded of how paradoxically it was only through letting go of endless searching that I finally found peace, both as a child and as an adult. Working with my daughter in the creation of this photographic series brought dual perspectives to it. Hers is the subject, seeker, and wanderer. Mine is the creator and observer, as we together find respite in the journey. I began shooting this series without a clear goal in sight. But as it evolved, it became a visual reconstruction and reimagining of my childhood wanderings in the woods and what kind of fears and fantasies I harbored. This is not the reality I lived, but a bittersweet version of what I hoped for in a time filled with loneliness and longing. Drawing on fairy tales and mythology as strong visual influences, I've deliberately mixed beauty and dark symbolism to show both the allure and implied danger inherent in venturing into the unknown. As Joseph Campbell writes in The Power of Myth about self-knowledge, the dark moment is the moment when the real message of transformation is going to come. At the darkest moment comes the light. Beautiful. Thank you. So in discussing this series with everyone, a question I was recently asked was, how did it start? How did I get started on it? And um, it actually all began uh, well, it's been about two or three years since I first started shooting it. And I went out to the Arroyo, which is a kind of a wilderness area in Pasadena with my daughter. And I was taking photos of her and I just impulsively asked her to cover her eyes and like a hide and seek. And when I came home and I saw that image, this image, it had this feeling of being so innocent and lonely and kind of dark. And it spurred in me this kind of remembering of my childhood and what I started to do was to write about it and to write about the ways in which I might depict that and, and the way that I might set up scenes to do that. And I knew that I wanted to work with my daughter in, um, on this project. And another thing that I knew that I wanted to do was integrate personal artifacts into it. So for example, in the first image where you see the girl holding a diary that is actually my childhood diary. And the silver tray that has some hair on it is um, an heirloom, 
excuse me, a family heirloom. And, um, and then there's other elements that are not necessarily, um, they're not actually from that time, but they're of that time. Like this window that we're looking at, I grew up in an old Victorian house and this reminded me of looking out the windows of the house. So there's a lot of personal elements that I infused into this work. Um, even knowing that they would only be known by me, I still put them in because fundamentally, I would say I created this series for myself, and um, which has made it very um, fulfilling. It also, there's for about the first year and a half when I was shooting it, I didn't show it to anyone. And I think that now I see that that actually held me back because once I did start showing it to people and getting input and maybe reshooting some of the shots I'd done, I feel like it just got even richer and, and better. And I have changed it a lot over these past two or three years. And that's because what I've discovered is that memories change over time. You know, you're, your history is the memories in your head, but as you look at them differently, they feel different. Um, anyway, I want to stop for a second and just see, uh, Ellen, is there any questions or anything yet? It's been a really, really magical presentation thus far. Really, really nice. Um, I know that I, I've done a little exploration in self-portraiture, but I've never done it like you have with using your daughter. Yeah. So, what is what does she feel about you putting your memories on her or using her right she knows what i'm doing um she, well she loves going to the wilderness areas she's always up for that but the the problem sometimes comes when she doesn't want to do exactly what i tell her to do and so that is why i started paying her <laughs> and <laughs> yeah so she got 15 dollars a shoot and developed a you know, she got a lot of dolls from that. That's so um, that, yeah. that, that was a great way to get her involved. Yeah. But I mean, she, she does find it interesting. Um, yeah. Does she get like this photograph that we're looking at right now with her looking in the mirror? Does she, does she embody it? Does she, do you talk to her about what you felt like as a child? And so that she kind of feels something or is it is it more of a is she in the zone and then you're able to pull from that um well i she's very art directed like i really tell her exactly what to do that i'll be honest um but when we come home i do show her the work because i also want her to see you know she was living it but she so she couldn't see what i saw and I, i'm like oh look this is what it looks like you know and i think that um I think that's interesting for her to see herself differently too. Well, it's a wonderful way for the two of you to do something together. On, yeah. On top of it, not to mention the whole cathartic, you know, aspect of making this work. Yeah, definitely. We are definitely absolutely interested in having the audience participate in questions. Elizabeth, this is from Britt Selvason. She wants to know, is it a set of sequence or a narrative of sorts? Right, that's a good question. So it's not exactly a linear narrative. It's more of like, I would say a mood piece. Yeah, I struggled with that. So I took a class or I, I approached it different ways. I took a class with Aline Smithson recently. And in that class, one of the things that I tried with this work experimenting was to put text under each image. And I tried different sequences to see like, did it need to be a story exactly, or was it more about a mood? And I, I felt that the text and, and trying to fit it precisely into a storyline wasn't quite what it worked for. Yeah, you're getting wonderful feedback. They really love the work. Oh, great, thank you. That means a lot. Is this, is this where you go, the forest? Is it near your home? Yeah, so that's another thing. Um, this was shot in three different locations, and I definitely developed a love of forests and trees, which I already had, but it got more intense. Um, so Canyon Park in Monrovia is a really big park where I shot some of it. The, the image with the like undulating tree branches, that one, that's Canyon Park, which is fabulous. Hahamunga Watershed. 
Park in La Cañada is where I shot a lot of the stuff that shows tree roots because they were doing some excavating and a lot of roots were exposed, which made it really perfect. And then the Arroyo in Pasadena also as well. So you really had to do some location shoot, you know, scouting. Yes. So, I mean, there's 18 images here, but I do have, I mean, I, I guess every photographer shoots a lot more than they show, but I have a lot of imagery of just beautiful and dark woods and, and ultimately I feel like I would love to make this into a book and maybe I would be integrating that into it as well. Some of the environmental shots that I did. Wonderful. Well, Elizabeth, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I think you did a beautiful job mastering this lovely sequence and speaking about it. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce our second artist of the night, Michael Perez. He's our plus one from out of California. He is coming from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is a little bit later for him, so very, very appreciative that he is a night owl. We will do a quick view of his work in silence and then I'll introduce him. Okay, I would like to introduce Michael Perez. He is an award-winning photojournalist based in Philadelphia. His work has been published in National Geographic, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, and other national and international publications. Before quarantine life began, he would often get a funny text message and screen grab from people who, would, who were excited to spot him on TV while he was working, as we can see. Lately, his phone has been quiet, unless it's being used to make a photograph. Let's welcome Michael to share his story behind Window Seat. Michael, where are you? Can you hear me? I can hear, there you are. Great, thank you, Ellen. Thanks for the okay. great introduction and thank you for accepting me into the show. Um, the, uh, the picture of a, me at the football game is kind of a funny story. He got really upset at me taking this picture because they lost, but I guess we're not here to talk about sports. So off to window seat. Um, I guess next slide, please. I've always been fascinated with the panoramic format, um, the long rectangular frame and uh, slit photography. And I guess in this case, I'm using the iPhone panoramic feature. Um, I just love the distorted abstractions that slit photography and the iPhone recorded while it was exposing. Um, it reminded me, just watching the image appear on my screen reminded me of uh, printing that first print in the darkroom. It got me excited about photography. So I'm thankful for <laughs> the iPhone of all things get me really excited about photography um, other than shooting sports. Um, next slide. Oh, well, this one, I was a little bit surprised. It, well, let's go back. 
one more. Thank you. Um, no, we're fine there. <laughs> well, the vertical one, I was surprised because I didn't, I had no idea how the camera was going to record. This is passing under a tunnel of a parking garage. It was at a stoplight and I threw my phone up on the dashboard and just let it record as I drove, as I drove through when the light turned green. And the next stoplight, I, I was just shocked because I, I had I thought the lights would streak. I, I didn't I had no idea how the camera was going to record. Every, every frame I take shooting this way is just a complete surprise to me, and that that that's what I love about this technique. So next slide, please. And this one I, I was riding in the back of a cab, was stuck in traffic. And um, normally I, I try to hold the camera still against the window as we're moving on a plane or a car or a train. But this one, I, I, I was just moving the camera side to side. And then when I saw this, uh, again, amazed. It, it's just the love of photography all over again, just something new. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, I guess since uh, we've been locked down, I haven't been driving as much. So walking around the neighborhood, again, doing the same technique, just swinging the camera back and forth or, or, or sliding it side to side. I'm just amazed at the distortion that the camera records. It, it's just something that's not planned. It's, I'm just very happy with the results. Um, next slide, please. Again, this one was just driving around. Um, it's fun. Okay. Yeah, this one I was driving around. Again, had a camera taped to my car window and I would trigger the camera with uh, I guess the uh, the ear the ear the earplugs the earbuds, and uh, yeah, it just. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, this one the the. Again, it's all about distorted abstractions. I never know what the camera's going to get. I, I know the scene that I want to photograph. Um, I've been documenting this uh, the chocolate factory on, uh, around the corner from my house for a year now. And uh, it just didn't feel right shooting it with my regular camera, 35 millimeter frame. So I started shooting it using this, this technique. And it just, to me, it just came to life. So next slide, please. Again, I, 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 at the airport, I would put the, I, I would photograph the runway as we're taxiing away and I'm just surprised by the abstraction that it's recording. Next slide, please. The <laughs> chaos photography, I saw that. Uh, that's basically what it is. Um, again, a rainy day, some of the raindrops on my win window would blur out some parts of the, uh, blur out parts of the frame and I, I, I just really like this technique. <laughs> so next slide, please. And yeah, this was just chaos. I had no idea what was going to happen. Um, I was kind of scared taking this one because it was a little icy out. And uh, I'm never holding the camera as I'm driving. I'm always driving first. If I'm at a stoplight, I'll trigger the camera and then I'll, I'll start driving and then just let the camera go. And then next stoplight, I'll look at it real quick. And then uh, sometimes I'll pull over and, and, and text them to a friend, ask them what they think. So next slide, please. 
Next slide. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I just love walking around Philadelphia or driving around Philadelphia or even in just exploring landscapes, um, the format. I love exploring the landscapes in this format. Um, it's just something, it, everything just looks different to me in this format. Now I'm trying to read the chat also. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll field you a question. Britt Selvinson, she also wants to know, the panoramic format is very dynamic. If you make prints of these, how large and how long could they be? Yeah, I haven't made a print yet, but when I open them up in Photoshop, some of them are like 42 inches long by 11 or 12 inches high at, um, 300 or 200 dpi so I, i'm curious to see how these will look that size so i, I just had it, it's hard now because everything's closed right. so so one one day i'll, I'll try and I, I would really love to make a print of one of these things or a few of the or all of them actually so i have a question from doug hill you sure. mentioned that you enjoy the randomness or the unexpected results that you get with this technique you're using, but are you finding that you're now able to predict to some degree what the results are going to be? Or do you always want to be totally surprised? No, sometimes I can predict, but then when I'm surprised, I'm really, really surprised. And there have been times where I just pull over and I'll pull the image up and then I'll work on it on Snapseed a little bit. And then I'll just look at it for a long time. I mean, I, there have been times I'll be out in front of my house parked looking at, at pictures before I even walk in because I'm so excited to see what I got on my way home. So, fun. so I've got another question for you. Go ahead. This is from Brenda Whitehall Schneck Schneckler. Please forgive my pronunciation. I love the misregistration of the lines and the elements. Is there any post editing and what is, what is slit photography? Uh, most of the post says editing is just contrast, maybe a little bit of color correction, but slit photography, I was going to try not to get technical. It, it's, I don't know how to quite explain it, but with film, your film is moving the opposite direction of your subject. And it and your shutter stays open, and the film is moving across. I'd say a one millimeter slit. The the slit is one millimeter wide, so the, the, either the film is moving across to rec and recording, or there's also another camera that has a rotating lens that rotates 180 from side to side. And that records an image, uh, a panoramic image onto the, uh, the film. Um, I was always interested in it in college. I saw the work of George, George Silk. And he, he photographed, uh, I think it was the 1960 Olympic trials using slit photography. And he had a, an amazing photo essay in Life magazine. And it, it blew my mind away because he, he was just really creating a photograph and that's what I've always wanted to do and then one of my professors Andy D Andrew David Hazy he was talking about it and he's done a lot of it and he's a scientific photographer and I tried to make one I converted an old Minolta and an old Nikon into a slit camera by just taping some litho film on behind the shutter and I had a one millimeter opening and then I had to rewind the film and it was a limited success because I didn't have a constant wind on the film. So I would get a lot of lines mm. where I guess it, it would pause. So, but um, I, I just needed to hook up a motor to the rewind knob to get rid of some of those lines and get a smoother rewind, a, a smoother uh, pull of the film. And then I started work uh, I was staff photographer at the Inquirer, and then it just became about work. You know, I was busy all the time. I didn't have time to play around, and I, I was a general assignment photographer, so I was shooting 
sports news, just everything that you see in a newspaper. And then now I'm, I'm, I'm shooting a lot of sports for the Associated Press, so I don't really have time to, to make a, a film slit camera. So April, or was it April? No, it was sometime in 2015, I was on a train. And actually this, this was a day after. I was on a train heading down to Virginia I was just taking pictures out the window like I always do. And I just happened to hit the panoramic feature on the phone. And I put the phone up against the window and just let it record. And as it was recording, you could see the picture being made on the screen and it blew my mind away. It really felt like I was printing again, that first print that got me into photography. So, the entire train ride down, I, I went through my entire battery, couldn't shoot anymore. I got to my, I got to my friend's house. The next day I came back and, you know, I found, I found my plug, plugged it into the train and, and just was taking pictures until my phone was overheating. So it, it just, I, I love the way it looks. I love the excitement that it, I just really feel excited every time I make a frame. Like this one was really unexpected. Um, a friend of mine, John Gajewski, he, he we, we were both making these photographs and he was driving. And I always wanted to photograph this, this, this train trestle with the wires. And I think it was the first time I tried to make a vertical panoramic. So I, I put the camera on his dashboard as he drove under it. And then I looked at it, I, I, again, I was blown away. <laughs> It's just totally unexpected. So sometimes you know what you're gonna get and a lot of times, not really. Like this one again, I had no idea what it was gonna do to City Hall. <laughs> um, a friend of mine said he loved it. It's like crooked politics, crooked City Hall. And I, mean, I, I, I can drive that same route a hundred times and put the camera in the same place and it'll never turn out the same. So the, the airplane is, is funny because I could only shoot a few of these before the phone starts to overheat. And I really don't want to become one of those people you, you guys are all going to read on the news where, you know, so-and-so's phone blew up on a plane forcing it to land in Minnesota. <laughs> but the, yeah, this one I think was going to, La, no, not Los Angeles, going to Las Vegas. So... And when I started photographing planes, I had no idea what that line up top was until I um, zoomed in and it was the airplane wing. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> and then this one, I just love the palm trees. This is at McCarran Airport in Vegas. I have a question for you, Michael. And then we, sure. have, we have like about a minute and a half left. Oh, sure. Does your photojournalism background feed into your fine art photography or vice versa? I, I think they feed off of each other. Um, it, I'm always trying to find moments, um, always trying to construct a photograph, um, trying to tell a story. Uh, with my panoramics, I'm really just exploring the landscapes in a different frame. And while you're, while I'm tra while you're driving or, or just riding in a plane or a train, a rectangle, it just didn't feel right to me. And then when, when I did that first panoramic on a train, it really felt like, you know, I'm looking at a photograph from left to right, and it really felt like I was traveling with the photograph. Um, journalism, you know, always looking for a story, uh, a picture to tell the story. And, uh, I, I, yeah, it's it, it's. I guess it's hard to say. I don't know how to how to quite explain it. It, it, it just when I when I'm shooting, it just it, it just happens. And so this I, one you just answered. caught your eye. I'm sorry. This particular image that I'm resting on right now, you looked up. You're in the building. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different. Yeah, I, I always wanted to photograph skyscrapers, and I, again, I had no idea how the camera was going to record it. And uh, I was just really surprised and happy and shocked. <laughs> so it's really all about the surprise. It, it, it really is. It, it's, 
I keep going back to that first time I developed the print and for anybody who's ever worked in a darkroom, I think you're going to know what I'm talking about, dropping that paper in the developer for the first time and watching an image pop up. It, it really is a magical feeling. So before we close, Michael, we have another question that really wants, sure. they love your work. It's beautiful. They want right. to know exactly the process. You're using your iPhone to make these photographs and you're yeah. using panoramic mode. Yeah, I'm, I'm just using an iPhone on panoramic mode and you got to be careful when you're on a plane because for some reason the phone, I don't know the altitude or the pressure, it just overheats really quick after one or two and I, I just have to shut the phone off because I really don't want it to explode on next to the window. It, yeah, but yeah, it's these are all with my iPhone. Um, my normal photojournalism kit is two or three cameras with a wide angle lens and telephoto lens. Yep. Yep. I, did a, I did a little tennis photography myself. I know the kit. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, th th this kit is a lot easier on my back. <laughs> so. Yes, it is. Well, the work is beautiful. Thank you so much for staying up so late. And no, no worries. Thank you very much. Love it. All right. So. Our third artist this evening is Eric Weaver. He was an audio engineer who always had an interest in photography, but did not start exploring the medium until just two years ago. We're gonna take a little look at his work and then he'll speak. Great. Okay, I want to bring Eric Weaver to the to the party now. Don't touch your face is a wonderful exploration of being in the pandemic. And here we go. Where are you, Eric? Hi. Thanks, Ellen. I'm uh, in Los Angeles. There we go. I've had an awkward relationship with photography since I was about five years old, where I didn't know that there were anything but point and shoot cameras and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't capture the images that were in my head. Um, and I, I come to realize that it was because it was point and shoot cameras and I needed a, a real camera. And uh, when I would meet an actual photographer, I'd get really excited and let them know about my desire for knowledge and you're like, oh yeah, it's so easy, you know, you've got your exposure triangle and you just adjust your aperture to match your shutter speed and, and it would quickly turn into whistles and clicks and I realized I didn't even have the base knowledge to, to get started in this. And uh, this went on and on for years until just a couple years ago, I was on a, doing a concert down in Mexico City and there was a event photographer there named Laura Grogan. And I was watching her move around the room with her camera and, you know, making her adjustments and interacting with the artists. And it was like, okay, it's time to, to finally come to terms with this. So I came back home and bought a couple books, spent a few months uh, just reading. And when I finally felt like I had the knowledge from reading, I bought a camera and uh, I've been trying to make up lost time ever since. 
this uh, particular project really began as a means to entertain myself being unemployed due to COVID and uh, as a vehicle to learn some new things about photography. I'd been wanting to work on portraiture and uh, I bought this extra large dog cone thinking that I would do some uh, dystopian environmental portraits of people in grocery stores looking at empty shelves or whatever and uh, with the dog cone to reinforce the mantra of don't touch your face that's what we kept hearing over and over in the early days of this. And uh, the day after I bought it, the, safe, the safer at home orders kicked in and I couldn't hang out with anybody, especially to take photos. And uh, I was looking at some levitation photos online and I was like, well, why don't I try to do that? And I set everything up and got the lights out and uh, spent a multitude of hours trying to learn how to do this and uh, posted it on social media and had a, I guess people needed the levity of it and uh, got a lot of messages and that encouraged me to, to keep trying new ones every day. Um, so this is the first one right here and uh, they kicked it off and I'd given it the cute caption of, I meditated on it and figured out how to stop touching my face. And that, that was all I was gonna do was this one photo, but uh, it kept going after that. Again, all of this was uh, just a vehicle to explore photography here. I just wanted to play with um, just a backlit, strong backlight and silhouette. And here's another exploring the silhouette and uh, trying to see if I could take a photo of myself with my pants around my ankles and not have it come across as, as lewd or awkward. Uh, <laughs> lots of goofy stuff in this. I have to share a comment that just came through. Great concept, great execution, prime work for a book. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, this one was really popular. It, uh, I was really just trying to play with the dramatic lighting and seeing, uh, we are here in Los Angeles, you know, so might as well try some acting and trying to be convincing that uh, all of this is actually happening. I brushed my teeth for two hours straight trying to get this just the way I wanted. Self-portraits are tough. I don't know how many of you have spent some time working on it, but it's, it's a different endeavor. Uh, same line of thought here, just working on uh, dramatic lighting and trying to be convincing, trying to, you know, as if someone else outside was being a voyeur and sneaking in and taking a photo of me uh, shaving. That's one of the questions. Is It's from Kyle Bient. Diane, uh, forgive me. Um, he wants, is there an added element to your process being your own subject? It's, uh, it's would be so much easier to just put that cone on someone and say, here, let me pose for me while I take the photo. It's, uh, it's, it's tough to get a photo that's a composition that I like and being the subject you know, we're all way more uh, hard on ourselves than we are on others. So it's... Um, well, this particular image we're looking at right now, having a tripod or putting your camera in the exact right spot, that's very difficult. A like, lot of, I mean, I had nothing else to do. I'm unemployed and I probably put seven or eight hours into every one of these trying to get them you know, moving the tripod a little bit here and there and just trying to get it all to happen. So Britt has another question, a great question. It, it, it looks like you enjoy sharing your work. Do you ever get suggestions that prompt you to make another, a different photograph? Um, I did. And uh, some of them, you know, when I first started doing this and uh, friends and family members, there was a huge, huge list of these. Um, 
and uh, was talking to one of my really, really good friends about it. And he said, you've done really well up till now. Don't jump the shark. And I didn't take another photo of this series after that. Oh. <laughs> Everything seemed like it was, it was too on the nose after that. Um, this photo and the next couple are, uh, they started out just wanting to play with like a slow shutter speed to have, you know, to have the water coming out of the cone. And then it also became a challenge of how much skin I can show, how I need to pose, how I need to compose the photo so that it's, it's art and not creepy and, and uh, weird. I have a question from Terry Rory. He wants to know how much post-processing you do and what software, if you do do post-processing, do you use? Um, the only photo that had any post-processing uh, was the first one, the levitation photo. So I obviously had to stack two photos together. The rest of these, um, pretty much no cropping and it's in Lightroom, you know, uh, some contrast, light and dark adjustments, basic tone curve stuff, but that's pretty much it. Okay, so another question is why black and white and not color? Some of these were originally in color and uh, to be honest, I started making prints from home and I found that uh, right off the bat, I could nail the black and white the way I wanted them to look a lot easier than I could the color photos. I've since um, dialed in my color printing process and I'm pretty happy with it, but uh, that's why, that's really why these are black and white. It's, it's nothing uh, any deeper than that, unfortunately. This one tried to go a little bit more horror movie with the, the shower scene there. All of these photos had multiple setups of, you know, just exploring and, and really having fun and keeping myself occupied. So um, all of them had multitudes of outtakes that uh, were a lot of fun. Yeah, this photo is well liked, very well liked. Um, this, uh, just playing around, you know, this was one of the things where people were like, well, you could try and, you know, use a Q-tip. So I took it and, uh, tried to do a little bit of, uh, like sci-fi, you know, going where no man has gone before type thing, a little bit astronaut feel to it. People want to know if there's going to be more in this series and if, and where will you, where can they find your work? You can find these on my website, which is ericweaver.myportfolio.com. Um, and I don't know if there's going to be more in this series. Well, it would have to be, I don't know. There's a long list of unexecuted photos and put it that way you're getting a really good response. So it might encourage you to create more. That could happen. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. This was a lot of fun to do. Um, this is a multiple exposure. Again, you know, all of this just a vehicle to, to practice photography. So I wanted to play with multiple exposures in camera. And uh, this one had a really good outtake where on the computer was uh, the Twilight Zone text, but the rest of the photo was pretty much garbage, but it really fit what was going on. Uh, playing with water distortion. Um, went through several different shapes of glasses, uh, different amounts of water. A lot of pretty hilarious outtakes from this day's shots oh this is an idea from gal davis wash your hands next you know could be could be 
Oh, and I have another another little tidbit from JPAC5. I'm a teacher and this is great project for students who feel stuck. Love it. Great. Um, high speed sync with the flash to catch the popcorn in the air. Um, How much popcorn did you spill? The uh, apartment floor was pretty littered by the time I was, I was done. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, lots of great outtakes. This one, I initially deemed a failure because I was trying to get, I had an iPad set up in front of me with a bird on the iPad and it was supposed to be that I was so isolated and cooped up in my apartment that to get nature, I would, would look at an iPad through binoculars and I could not get that reflection to show up right in those binoculars. I spent a long time trying to get it to happen and almost got, went back to it, but um, I was going through these photos to uh, pull for the submission for this show and I saw it and I was like, you know what, that it stands okay without the, without the iPad and the bird in the, in the reflection. Well, very successful. Very nice sense of humor in a time when we all need a sense of humor. Yeah, it, uh, and you know, this was getting ready for the zombies because, you know, What's next? the year just keeps going. I don't know if it's, we should prepare, prepare for the zombies or the aliens or what, but uh, this year keeps, keeps coming at us. It's one of the early get together meetups with my family, my siblings and. Uh, How hard was it for you to pose them in the background like that? You know, I just had, I was using a digital camera for this and uh, with an app on the iPhone to trigger. So I would just watch the, the screen and when I saw them, when I saw us kind of line up in a good spot, I'd release the shutter. Um, we started talking every Saturday night, getting together for a meetup and, and talking for hours. So I had plenty of time to, uh, to experiment, to experiment and catch one. Yeah. And, uh, was noticing some really dramatic light and shadow out on my patio in the early mornings and wanted to get out there and play in that and try and get it to, to cut across me and see what I could get from it. And uh, it only made sense to be trying to drink a cup of coffee out there in the morning. Um, very accidental series. Started out uh, just trying to keep myself occupied. I'm glad you guys, thank you for, uh, for joining me. And, and I wanna say thanks to all my friends and family that encouraged me and that are here tonight. Um, and stay tuned, there's a lot of more great photography coming up. Well, I have to say, Eric, everybody really loved, loved the work. Um, book idea, you know, we're not through with this pandemic. You have a little bit more time on your hands. You can make a few more photographs, maybe with the wash your hands. And uh, yeah, it's uh, very successful. Thank you so much for submitting. Thank you, Ella. All right. Next up. Thank you so much. That was really lovely. We have our fourth presenter tonight. We, next up, we have Roberto Montoya and his project titled Falling Through the Abyss. We're gonna take a look at his work first and then I'll introduce him.
Okay. Adding to the depth of this striking collection of works, a fun fact about Roberto is that he used to be a taxidermist prior to finding his passion for photography. Roberto, let's take you take us through your work, Falling Through the Abyss by Roberto Montoya. Uh, yes, hello. Um, this project just basically came about um, because of the quarantine. Roberto. And, excuse me? We can't see you. There you go. Oh. Um, yeah, so this project came about through uh, being isolated in quarantine and um, trying to find means of expression, uh, not using a camera because uh, I'm going through. Uh, I'm going to school at uh, Arizona State University, and uh, in that time, I, I've learned about uh, chemigrams, which is this process of creating images with photosensitive paper and uh, darkroom chemicals. So. Uh, and you use different types of materials to draw on the paper. And that's how you create images. And uh, I just wanted to capture uh, the loneliness and frustration and uh, just the, the darkness that, that those feelings uh, bring, bring on us. So I wanted to have an outlet for that. And uh, this is the first picture of that project. Uh, I used grass from my backyard and a fixer chemical to draw. And then I, I dipped the image into developer. And this is what comes out. It's kind of a random kind of process, but it's, it's fun. Uh, this I created using feathers. Just still, I wanted to create that hole, that abyss kind of notion of loneliness and just emptiness. Uh, this, I wanted to create a notion of just things falling apart. And uh, this is how I was feeling at that time. And, uh, I used a different process with this. I used uh, a lot of um, different uh, temperatures for, for the fixer and developer. And uh, it gives oxidization into the, the chemicals and, and creates that sort of tone. Um, this picture I used, uh, I wanted to create kind of like a falling sun. And uh, I was cooking one day and uh, I had half a lemon left over. And it kind of, for some reason, it just reminded me of the sun. And um, I decided to use it and this is what came out. Uh, this was a day that I was really frustrated. Uh, and I, it, I used tape in the center of the, of the paper and then started scratching and kind of just splashing developer onto the paper and scratching. And this is what came out. Yeah, people are loving your process, Roberto. It's Thank very, you. Thank it's very rich. It's very, very abstract, interesting. You feel your pain. Um, I have a question from Rollins. How do you mm -hmm. see the image ahead of time, especially from a blank sheet of light sensitive photo paper? Uh, I don't try to see an image, but I try to put a feeling, a, a feeling into it. And it's, since it's a random process, I try to just put a lot of, a lot of what I'm feeling into it. And it just comes out the way that I like it. Uh, I use this as, uh, I use nail polish. I got this idea from the creator of this process. His name was Pierre Cordier. Uh, he was Belgian and um, he developed this process by accident uh, using nail polish and developer. And so uh, I decided to kind of 
take take a little note from him and, and create something like that. The, the comments, I mean, it's very cathartic. It's coming from within. We feel your, we feel you in this process. It's, it's very, it's exciting. Uh, this, I, 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 I wanted to have different tones of black. So I, I dipped uh, one side and then I dipped the other side. And then I, I used tape and then I, I dipped it back into the developer and uh, I sprayed fixer. Oh. So it has that kind of spacey kind of um, feeling to it. This one as well, I, I used a, a, a different process from the other one, but I still use nail polish, but I use more of a fixer so it had lighter shades. This I use glass, just different glasses, uh, pieces of broken glass. And uh, I wanted to create like a barrier, like a feeling of a barrier. And uh, this is what I, I made. I have a question for you, Roberto. Have you ever taken several of these photographs and put them together and see, and see what happens if they are, you make one out of several of them? You know? Mm, I've never tried that, no. It's just uh, a lot of the process is just random. Uh, I don't like constru uh, constructive things. I don't, I, I like abstract things. So I like the, the one kind of imprint that I can make and it's, it kind of feels genuine and unique and not repetitive in any sense. So. Cool. Um, this, I, I, I used a cotton swab to uh, rub developer and fixer. So it creates a, a different uh, pattern of color, different texture, and then I use tape and then dip that into uh, the developer and this, this is what comes out. It's okay, so really, I, uh, I want to... Roberto, Roberto, this is an absolutely gorgeous photograph. I, I had a little clarity, a little help from Britt, and in that if you had took several of these photographs as is, but put them in a diptych or a triptych, they would have it. They would relate to each other. They would still be, mm. you know, unique and individual, but they may play off each other in different ways. That would also be very interesting. Just, just something to take yourself. Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But this is a beautiful, go back to this photograph, it's beautiful. Oh, well, yeah, this, this always reminds me of um, abalone. Uh, uh, just uh, kind of an abstract abalone, right? Um, but it's just that feeling of, of a hole inside of me. And just, uh, just really glad uh, how it came out. This was another, uh, just, the concept of things falling apart and uh, kind of being in, in a in a vacuum, you know, of of just emptiness. And uh, this, I use night jasmine and the leaves to create this image. Sorry. And, oh no, no, that's uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, this was uh, just as I started uh, experimenting more with the process. I became more comfortable with the mediums that I was using. So uh, just opened the fridge one day and looked in it and grabbed the, the pancake syrup and started uh, pouring it on, on the paper. And uh, this is what came out. I love that. I love how maple syrup or pancake syrup could become art. Love it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, everything. Everything. Uh, um, yeah, this is paper and um, butter as well. And uh, I use fixer uh, in a spray bottle to create kind of that spacey background, kind of like a, a like an exploding galaxy or something, you know. Um, just wanted to do that. Uh, this one I used uh, 
was going to bed one night and I, I, I was going to put out my candle and I saw there was a, a nice puddle of liquefied wax. And uh, I, right away I went and grabbed a piece of paper and started uh, working the paper and pouring developer and fixer on it and kind of created a, like a space creature. And this is just tape. Uh, and I would dip the pieces of tape into a uh, fixer. The ones that are darker would go into developer. The ones that are lighter would go into, uh, the ones that are lighter would go into the fixer. And uh, I would kind of just move them around kind of randomly. And some of them kind of created faces, and just random shapes. Really chaotic. It seems that as you got more comfortable, you, you got a little bit more into, you know, experimenting. Yes, yes, totally, totally, totally. Um, yeah, and this is um, just little pieces of paper that I crumpled up and, and mixed in with developer and fixer and smashed them onto the, uh, smashed them onto the, the photographic paper and that was it. It was just another means of escaping my frustration. Well, one absolutely magical, so creative. Debbie Arlick writes in, so creative with endless possibilities, Roberto. Power, powerful homage to La, La Maholi Naj, Man Ray, and the early abstract photographers. You can't really do better than that, Roberto. Thank you very much for a very nice comment. Really cool. Yeah, thank you, thank you. These fascinating, it's, it's fascinating how you used, you know, chemicals and just normal everyday tape, paper, syrup, lemon, and you created these pieces of artwork. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. All right, is there, if there's any more questions? We will say thank you so much, Roberto. It was wonderful. Everyone, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. I am so happy to introduce you to our final artist of the night, Safi Aliya Shabayak, with her project, Vespertine Beings, Those Who Flourish After Dark. We're gonna take a little look at her work first, and then we will proceed. Okay, after witnessing 9-11 firsthand in New York City, Safi went from dressing the living as a celebrity fashion stylist to dressing the dead as a mortician. I'd like to welcome our last presenter tonight, Safi. Safi Alia Shabayak, here we go. Okay, thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Open Show, and all of the attendees for, um, for this uh, wonderful presentation tonight. <clears throat> so I'd like to read you a little something I've written about this series. When light shifts to darkness, personas emerge and move forth into the night. It is in darkness that the world truly comes alive. This body of work explores modern subcultures through themes of identity, gender, and self-representation. 
The subjects of this work are individuals who live outside of the norm and use external creative expression, such as costume, culture, performance, ritual, body modification, and alter egos, to reveal their true selves, foster acceptance, and build community. I have always been drawn to anomalies and find true beauty in difference, uniqueness, and what some might consider flaws. I've always embraced the other, perhaps through a perceived kinship with those deemed outliers, eccentrics, gypsies, artists, and experimenters. These creative souls are my chosen tribe, and it is here that I explore their worlds and share their stories. So the work that you're seeing tonight um, is a small portion of a much larger body of work. The subcultures that I've drawn the imagery from are um, the neo-burlesque movement, lucha libre, drag, and fetishists, but I have gone into other subcultures to document as well. And these are ongoing. Um, this is an ongoing project. I've been building this work for about five years, and I plan to continue it once all of this activity starts up again. Um, so, for instance, this is an example of the drag community. This is Kunda F. Couture, uh, dressed as Tranimal. This, she is a drag artist. And for those who don't know, drag is a term that originated in 19th century British theater as slang to describe women's clothes worn by men. Typically, drag queens are known to wear women's clothing and often present themselves in exaggeratedly feminine ways as part of their, as part of their performance. Um, and usually drag queens are biological males who create these personas. There is a counterpart to that known as drag kings uh, who wear men's clothing and perform stylized forms of masculinity. And these are usually biological females who create these personas, but that is not um, necessarily the case. People of any gender association can be drag queens or drag kings, including cisgender individuals, transgender individuals, non-binary individuals. Um, so I don't want to generalize, um, you know, that just biological males dress up as drag queens and vice versa, because other people do participate and dress as these personas uh, as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so these are luchadors. And uh, lucha libre is a term used in Mexico for professional wrestling. It is characterized by colorful masks, uh, rapid sequences of holds, and high-flying maneuvers. The masks have spe special significance. Um, they're colorfully designed to evoke the images of animals, gods, ancient heroes, whose identities the luchador takes on during a performance. Matches are typically performed as um, duos or trios, so they tag team. Um, and um, <clears throat> luchadors can often be seen in public uh, on their off time wearing these masks and they go to great lengths to conceal their true identities because the mask is synonymous with the luchador. So these two guys are Magno, he's the larger one behind, and Pinatita, who's the little pinata in the front. And so there are, um, there's like a whole mini uh, component to uh, Mexican wrestling. And so you'll have, you know, full-size luchadors, you'll have smaller luchadors, and it's a whole, um, it's a whole, uh, it's all part of uh, their culture. Okay, I have, a, I have to give you interrupt already. Okay, um, sure, sure, sure. Has a question. Safi, your work always blows me away. So much richness, depth, and layers. Of course, reminiscent of Deanne Arbus. You don't seem an observer, but rather an intricate part of the environment. And your affection for this, your subjects is so apparent. Can you say something about how you gain trust and access of the people you photograph and what, they, what the experience is like? Sure. Um, first off, thank you for that compliment. That's, I mean, all of that was a huge compliment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, um, I would start to attend these events and um, over time, th this kind of documentary work takes time. You can't expect to just go to some place, get ex ac access to backstage like you see right here with the burlesque dancers and be able to do all of this. You have to build trust, you have to build friendships, you have to um, prove yourself. And um, I would start to go to these events and I would try to make connections and I would bring my camera and hope that somebody would let me get my foot in the door somewhere. And eventually when I did get my foot in the door, I would, 
I would document in my style and my way and with the compassion that I do think I have and hopefully um, sounds like that is reflected through the comments. Um, through that and through showing them the work, I built that trust. And now that I've been in there for five years, my name gets passed around, people know who I am. They want me to come in and document them and I want to document them. I mean, I really appreciate the things that these people are doing, the way that they live their lives, the way they're pushing their bodies um, and challenging societal norms. All of that is really important to me. Krisha, so I hope Krisha, that answers the question. Yes, and I have to say, Krisha loves the respect you bring to the subcultural world, subculture world. It's clear you respect them and it shows in your work. Thank you, I appreciate that tremendously. Thank you. Um, so should I continue or are there more questions? Yes. Continue? Okay, so uh, we've bypassed it, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about neo burlesque. They'll come back up again um, throughout the rotation of images. Um, so neo burlesque is a revival and modernization of the first wave of burlesque, which is kind of referred to as vintage burlesque. Um, vintage burlesque took place from the mid 1800s on through the 20th century, disappearing around the 1970s or 80s. And then the neo burlesque movement kind of started in the mid uh, 1990s, I think around 1995, and continues currently. And so there are different styles of neo burlesque, just as there are different styles of, you know, luchadors and drag and whatnot. Um, some of them do uh, pay homage to the vintage burlesque and focus on the glitz, the glamour, and the tease. And then there's a lot of underground burlesque troops like this one that's pictured here. Um, these ladies are part of a troupe called Bell, Book, and Candle, and they present a witch-inspired burlesque uh, show. And so a lot of those underground burlesque shows um, have a broader agenda than just to physically stimulate the audience. There's off, often a feminist slant to them. There's a political, you know, political commentaries are made through the performance. Um, it goes beyond just the titillation and tease of seduction. And also with the neo-burlesque movement, um, I think something that's really special about it is that it is uh, very inclusive of a diverse range of body types, ethnicities, and genders. It's also not just biological females who are performing burlesque. <clears throat> um, so this is the fetish community, and this is outside of a fetish club. Um, fetishists uh, are defined as people who have an excessive devotion or commitment to a particular thing, like that's the dictionary definition. Um, this can include um, the BDSM community, kink, dominance and submission, role playing. There's lots of different types of, um, you know, subset subcultures within this world. And I, I'm still kind of on the cusp of this world. I haven't gotten in as deep yet as I have with burlesque and drag. I'm, um, you know, like I said, building these relationships takes time. So. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I think I had been in this world maybe for like a year or two. I'm still in the beginnings of forming these relationships and because it is more sensitive maybe than drag or burlesque, it is, um, I think it takes longer to build that trust and that confidence uh, for people to allow me into these private sessions that they have. Um, this here is another luchador. This is Extreme Tiger, as seen through the legs of Lucy Fur, who is his uh, ring gal, who brings him out to introduce him to the crowd. And so this moment is happening right before he uh, goes into the ring to um, have the match. We can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, I don't, you can't see it? Uh, it just came up now. It's drag. Are you on the same? I think you're on the same page as me now. Um, this is Aurora Sexton. She's a transgender performer. And this photo was taken backstage last year at the Drag Queen of the Year pageant. It was the first annual Drag Queen of the Year pageant. And sadly, because of the pandemic, the second annual Drag Queen of the Year pageant did not get to happen. So hopefully it'll happen in the future. Next slide, please. Um, oh, actually, there's a quote I'd like to share with you all that I think pertains. Um, Amanda Palmer, the musician, has said, uh, sometimes the mask is the tool that lets you get at the truth. And I think that that's really true for a lot of these people. Um, them being able to uh, express themselves creatively in this way allows them to really fulfill their true identities and their true selves. That society um, 
can't control. These are um, fetish models in a fetish club. They're modeling uh, some latex fashion. So Safi, people want to mm -hmm. know, what has attracted you to start exploring these subcultures? Okay, well, that's a great question and a very um, in-depth question. Um, I come from a culturally diverse family. My father was from Egypt and my mom is from um, French, Scottish, Native American bloodlines. So my upbringing was always uh, culturally diverse. Um, we traveled the world a lot when I was a child. And uh, that experience, I think, uh, made such a lasting impression on me to be able to see these cultures at a young age and open my heart and my mind to alternative styles of living, um, maybe not these kinds of subcultures, but just different ways of, of living in different cultures, different foods, different languages. Um, you know, I'd done all of that before, I don't know, by, the, by fourth grade or sixth grade, we had done all of this traveling. And so the world as I knew it was much larger than just growing up in a town and not ever leaving that place. So, um, I also was a breech birth, and I think that that has something to do with it. I came into the world in a, in a strange way, um, but first mooning the world. And I think that, <laughs> that I've just been a little bit off ever since. So I am attracted to um, people who live in, in unusual or unexpected ways and who present themselves in unusual or unexpected ways. Um, I'm interested in transformation and character and role playing. Did that answer the question? I, I don't know if I just totally got off topic. Nope, you're all good. And and we have another question from Britt Salveson saying, asking, do you edit as you shoot or do you accumulate many images and then decide what works? Do, do you mean I, after you, an event? Yeah. Or, or, or you know, you know okay. do you feel like you've got it or do you accumulate many photographs and over a course of a lot of time, then you kind of figure it out. Okay, so I actually have, um, I have a long-winded answer to that one too. I think everything I tell you is long-winded, but um, I, am a, I, I was born into film. When I first started shooting, I was probably about five years old. That's when I found photography. I fell in love with photography. My mom enrolled me in a pinhole camera class at the Museum of Science and Industry, as it was known back then. Now it's the California Science Center. And from that day forward, I had found um, my new love and my companion for my life. And um, from that experience, I ended up going to college, UCLA. I, I studied many things, ended up in fine art. and. Um, you know, still during the film years, digital had not come to be yet. We were on the cusp of, um, I think Photoshop had just been invented and like the digital tech was so excited about it. So that was like towards the end of me graduating. And that wasn't really my world. My world was a film camera where I had to know my settings. I had to select a certain ASA for my film and I had to choose color or black and white. And I had to go in and just like be determined, this is what I'm doing and I have to make work and be conscious of everything. I have to be conscious of my edges, I have to be conscious of my composition, my layers, everything needed to be very well thought out. So when I go to these events um, or these clubs, I'm still in that mindset of being very uh, intentional about everything that I do. Um, I am not rapid firing and then editing a ton of images later. I am very conscious. So even when those luchadors are flipping, I am jockeying for my position to get them in the right spot and I'm clicking the shutter. I'm not taking five motor, you know, 500 motor drive shots at once. I'm being very, very, very intentional about my shots. So when I get home, I don't wanna sit in front of the computer. My fun is being with my camera out in the world and being with these people. The, the least amount of work I wanna do is back here at my computer, um, even though now I'm shooting digitally. So I am sitting at a computer and doing minor editing. Um, but again, I'm not doing big moves. In uh, Lightroom, when I look at my work, I'm just selecting my images and I'm doing like the minor adjustments of maybe contrast and, you know, um, I don't even know what I do because I don't do that much. Um, so it's really just the, the minor adjustments. Um, again, did that answer the question? <laughs> it was brilliant. I've, I've shared a few photographs as you, as you spoke. Sure, that's totally fine. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I mean, perhaps I'm creating my own archetypes in a world where I wanna belong by photographing these people. Um, 
I find that they uh, really are in tune with who they are, that they've built these communities because they needed to be able to express themselves in this way and that they're very accepting of the people who are amongst them doing, it's not the same thing, but they're doing similar things, right? They also need to express themselves in this way. Um, they, a lot of them are pushing their bodies to the max, which I think I mentioned before, which um, is uh, appropriate for this image of the luchadors. They are, um, you know, risking injury, sometimes tempting fate. Um, they are pushing the brackets that have kind of been designated as the boundaries of what our bodies can do. So in a way, these people are like modern gladiators. You know, they're really uh, testing um, the limits of uh, physicality as well as creativity. Um, even the dancers do that. Um, they are flinging their bodies in ways that I didn't even know were possible, you know, and the, and the moves are very um, determined. Um, this is a, another latex uh, fashion model showing fashion in a latex club, I'm sorry, in a fetish club. And this is also in a fetish club. This is a fetishist getting a nice little tickle from somebody with a feather. Um, this again, this is backstage at a drag event. This is Gigi Monroe on the right and Gigi's assistant on the left who was helping prepare wardrobe and wigs. Uh, this was also at the Drag Queen of the Year pageant. And um, generally speaking, the drag shows that I go to, the, the artists are taking care of their own wardrobe, their own costumes, their own makeup, um, their own wigs. For an event like this, there were multiple costume changes, multiple looks, there were performances, there were, you know, it's a talent show as well as a, um, you know, beauty pageant. Um, so they actually, these individuals had, um, I don't know if a handler is the right word, but um, they had their posse who was helping with the backstage uh, transitions between looks. This is Miss Tosh. She is part of the neo burlesque movement and she uh, is more like a throwback to the vintage burlesque. And these are, uh, this is a luchador in the front and his ring girl behind him. And um, the, this luchador is Chupacabras and he is being presented to the crowd again before entering the ring to do the fighting. And uh, this is Amanda Lepore in the middle. She is a famous transgender performer. And um, on our viewing left, uh, to her right, is Love Bailey, who is another transgender performer. And this was at a fetish club. Well, and I think this is all of them. I think this is your last slide. If there's any more questions, please. The power is reminiscent of Ouija to me. That's one of the comments, which is Thank a you. very lovely comment. Ouija is one of my influencers, so is Deanne Arbus. So both of those comments are uh, much appreciated. <laughs> Roland says, your use of black and white is very strong despite the vibrant colors these subjects could present. Do you only shoot in monochrome for this type of work or do you explore color as well for your other projects? Um, that's a great question, Rollins. Thank you. Um, I actually do shoot them in color as well. I'm shooting raw, so I'm getting both. But my, my camera is always set to monochrome unless there's a reason for color to exist. And for me, um, I definitely go through phases with how I see the world. And like I mentioned before, having been born into film, I consciously go into places with um, a notion of how I'm going to shoot them. So right now I'm in a black and white phase, which I've been in for several years now. And when I go into these clubs, I'm going in with the mindset of black and white. My monitor on my LCD screen is black and white. It's monochrome, um, you know, it's set to monochrome um, so that I can think in monochrome. And um, when I see something that I'm shooting in monochrome that I know the color adds another element that's necessary, then when I get home and I pull those pictures out of the camera and I'm processing them, I will let it live in color. But it's a very conscious decision again, and it's rare when those moments come in. I'm mainly black and white right now, um, with the exception of a few. It, it, the work is wonderful, Safi. And thank you, Ellen. Yeah, it was it was great. And I'm just I think we've we've come to the end of our show um, of sorts. I'm going to un, un, unshare.
And if there's any questions that anybody has to somebody, everybody, all the artists can un, un, uh, can reveal themselves. And if there is any question from the audience for a particular audience. Well, I have to say, I'm very, very, very grateful for all of your um, help in putting this together. It was, it was a truly wonderful night. So I wanna thank everybody who joined us. Uh, just a little reminder, if you, if you loved what we did here today and tonight, you, we, we would love a little donation to keep us going. It, Zoom costs money, little things cost money. And Forum in September, we have Iber, Iberinex Pirello coming and that we have more programs lined up. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Michael, for coming all the way from Philadelphia. We love that the pandemic has allowed us to open our, our uh, Zoom so we're all over the world. Have a great night, everybody.